Thank you for listening to the Damage Report podcast, the show covering the true threats facing our country and what you can actually do about them. You can support this free podcast by leaving us a review and giving us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you happen to be listening to it. Every review helps more people discover the show at no cost to you. Welcome to another episode of The Damage Report. I am John Adarola. It's another Friday show, but don't worry. This is not one of those ones where, as has become so common, gigantic news has dropped on us and we have to pick up the pieces. We do have big news, of course, but we're going to have a little bit of fun. And joining me to help do that, Therese in the studio. Hey, how are you? Welcome. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. How now, you've been? Been, you've been on our network, our po- uh, podcast audio network for yes. some time with your show. Yes, Tory uh, Show. Yes. The Tory Show, um, which I want to talk about a little bit later on. Please. But I believe this is the first time you're on one of our show shows? I believe that is true. Okay. I think that's true. Okay, well, it's great to hear. Obviously, you have, a, you have an amazing reputation, goes back some time. Uh, you think I have an amazing reputation? I appreciate yeah. that, sir. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Not everyone agrees with you, so thank you for saying well, that. Well, it's politics, so it's going to be a little bit complicated. But I think that you've done a great job of... Sort of crossing multiple worlds. Thank you. In a way that I wish was more common. Sure. I feel like very often now, like I used to, my, my Twitter used to be talking about stuff I found interesting. But now, because I'm in political commentary, anything I say that doesn't specifically have to do with some pressing issue is considered like a waste of time mm. or shallow or something like you that. Know, Clarence, but you've always done cool. Clarence Page mm-hmm. told me, before I was fully into talking about politics, he was like, you know, I used to write about Sly Stone, mm-hmm. and now I do this. There's yeah. not some necessary barrier to where you can't do both, where you can't combine both. Mm-hmm. And he gave me the courage to feel like, oh, well, I can. Talk, I I have interest in this. I have interest in that. Why mm-hmm. can't I talk about both? Yeah. Good idea. Yeah. Okay, that gives me a little bit more courage. Uh, over the course of the show, we're going to talk about a lot of different things. We're going to be starting off with the latest on uh, the disappearance and obvious murder of Jamal uh, Khashoggi. Uh, we've got some uh, pretty awesome videos from uh, Beto O'Rourke's town hall with CNN last night. Uh, Ted Cruz was not there because Ted Cruz apparently is not that interested in debating him. <laughs> They've had a few. Um, we've got Donald Trump uh, in the next phase of the latest phase of his war on the media and normalizing violence and hatred towards journalists. Uh, we've got an amazing radio ad, ad out of Arkansas. If the Democrats win, what is coming for African Americans? You'll find out a little bit later on in the show. Mm. And then we're going to be closing out the week with some questions that you guys submitted on Twitter. Uh, Trey and myself are going to be uh, discussing a little bit later on. Good. So why don't we jump into it? Let's do it. Okay. Donald Trump still doesn't want to take seriously the death of uh, the U.S. permanent resident and Washington Post uh, columnist and journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, he is trying to walk this very careful line about what the response from the U.S. and our allies uh, should be. But he's walking that line as more and more information is coming in that makes it clear that what we generally believe to have happened immediately after his disappearance over a week ago is likely to have been the case. And uh, I want to go over some of the developments in that story. Uh, This is coming out of, uh, bear in mind, unnamed Turkish officials, but they say that the Washington Post writer's body may have been disposed of in the nearby Belgrade forest. Uh, Investigators had studied CCTV footage to determine where vehicles belonging to the consulate went back on October 2nd. Because as we've been talking about, this uh, team of operatives flew in from Saudi Arabia, uh, came to Istanbul, were there for just a few hours. During that time, it's believed that he was killed. The body was disposed of somewhere. Apparently, it was such a mess that they had to repaint parts of the consulate after the killing. Um, but now they believe they have a lead on where the body may have gone. So you've been following this story uh, for some time. Uh, what, what have you thought about the international response and, and the domestic response? Well, just a couple of themes jump out. I mean, for one thing, this seems like something that would be in one of these sort of global movies, right? That da Vinci like, Code? Right, you, you've got to be kidding. You took a journalist and a, and, a, and a cutter, you cut his fingers off in front of the... Like, seriously? Mm-hmm. And dumped his body in a... Like, really? Yeah. Um, but, you know, the president has been saying the media is the enemy fairly consistently for several years now. Yeah. And so now that it's time to actually protect the life of a human being who happens to be a journalist, he's in a difficult position, right? Because mm-hmm. he's been saying, like, well, media's the enemy. And so if you think they're the enemy, then perhaps they should be killed. Perhaps we'd be yeah. better off if they were. So he's in a very difficult position. Um, he's been handling it typically, be- coddling the dictators, believing what mm-hmm. they say, believing in conspiracies about rogue killers yeah. rather than actually searching for the truth, believing in these people to search for the truth, which is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, loose with facts. So we see all the things that we typically see with Trump in this situation. I mean, notice, like, he believes 
uh, the, the Saudi government, right, the royal family. He also believes Vladimir Putin. He also believes Kim Jong-un. He does not mm-hmm. believe Hillary Clinton. He does not mm-hmm. believe Dr. Blasey Ford. He does not believe Dianne Feinstein. Mm-hmm. What do we notice here? Powerful male dictators. Yeah. He believes with no evidence. Prominent American women, he does not believe no matter what. No matter it's, what the evidence, yeah. It's fairly consistent and fairly disgusting. And mm-hmm. also, I appreciate that you said in your intro... Uh, which was extraordinary that you do that with no prompter. Oh, I, I never talked that long on television without a prompter. Um, I, I, You're doing th- it right now. No, no, well, we're just, but no, that you call him a permanent resident, right? Mm-hmm. And it was important that in one of Trump's first tweets about this, he made sure to underline Saudi citizen. Like, yeah. he's not really my responsibility. He is a Washington Post reporter and a permanent resident of America. He is your responsibility, sir. Yeah. And you are dropping the ball. Yeah, and I would say in terms of Our obvious desire to see reform come to Saudi Arabia, he is an important voice that has the credibility and the history to help provide that dissent, that necessary view, partially from the outside because of his exile, but obviously partially from the inside because of his birth there and his his background there. Um, We have an interest in the... I guess in the pursuit of international reform that voices like that would continue to sure. live and exist. And so uh, you sort of touched on this. I, I do want to talk about this a little bit more because um, there is this uh, discussion going on where some people are saying that, uh, I think Mika Brzezinski was saying this recently, that uh, it is likely that there is some link between Donald Trump's rhetoric about the media, calling them the enemy of the people, and this killing. And whether you think that that link exists or not, the Saudi regime certainly seems to have acted as if they believed he was the enemy of the state, sure, enemy of absolutely. the people. Uh, do you think that it's fair to say that there could be some link there, or is that re- overreaching? You know, I believe that Trump's rhetoric has an impact within America, mm-hmm. signaling to professional racists, Greg Kessler, Richard Spencer, the like, the Proud Boys, these sort of people, um, that it's okay to do what you want to do. Mm-hmm. And the people we've seen who have uh, attacked journalists, the man who rammed a car, a truck into a newsroom and these sort of things have attacked or threatened. I think they are taking a message from the president that it is mm-hmm. open season on these sort of people. I am not ready to make that large of a leap to say that the Saudi royal family said Trump said it's okay. I think mm-hmm. they would do what they want to do within the kingdom, mm-hmm. whether it was Trump or Obama, and would feel like Trump, Obama, whoever, you're not going to tell us what to do in our country. Yeah. yeah, and I would say if you want to make the case that something Donald Trump is doing helps to provide some sort of – I guess, proactive cover for the Saudi regime to do this, I would say that his business dealings with them are probably a stronger case. And his previous communications with them, whatever they talked about during their big orb-grabbing meeting and all of that. But this um, is is terrorism, right? mm -hmm. This is politically motivated violence meant to send a message to other people. This is not just about silencing this one individual. This says to other journalists, this is what happens when you criticize uh, uh, the kingdom. And so others will have to think twice about, is it worth it? Is it worth it? If you have children, you may be even more like, I, this is not worth it. I can't go that far. I can't you know, widow my wife and leave my kids. This is too much. So then there are voices that will be silent because yeah. of this. Um, that's not right. Like no. media freedom is critical to democracy. Yeah. And this will send a message. And the way that Americans take it, I and mean, we are more courageous, I think, as American media than than people are allowed to be in other places. But it has to have a chilling effect, even in America, that he yeah. goes out and says these things about, we are the enemy, right, and does not defend us. Uh, and then one of our own gets killed in a brutal public way. And he's like, I, I don't know, maybe it was rogue killers. Like, yeah. What? Yeah, and, and by the way, like we can have sort of a, a discussion after the fact about whether his rhetoric against the media helped to make the Saudis think that they could get away with this. That's an interesting philosophical question at this point. But does anyone doubt that his response now is making future killings more likely? Yes. Like he is yes. he is coming out and saying, I'm not going to jeopardize deals. Yes. So they now know as long as we keep buying weapons, we can do whatever we want. Yes, and there is a pure example of might makes right, right? Mm -hmm. They have the money, so let them do what they want to do. And it's definitely a message, God forbid, somebody go, I mean, it's inevitable. Somebody will go missing in Russia. Somebody will go missing uh, somewhere else, Argentina, who knows? And And Russia regularly does Russia regularly, but other places. And 
you know that Trump will not uh, be a big problem for this. He's not going to ban you. He's not going to sanction you. He's not going to embarrass you even. He's giving them all the time in the world yeah. to figure out some crazy some response. Excuse. And it, it's, it's very dispiriting. And I feel as media sort of just left out in the wind to dry mm-hmm. of like, you know, Maybe if something bad happens to you, we really don't care. Yeah. Because you're the enemy. I mean, like... That was his response to the capital exemption. And and nothing... Media hasn't really done anything that deserves this from him. Mm -hmm. If there was some big story about him that was patently false... Mm We could begin to say, okay, I understand why you're look. Mm-hmm. I understand why Hillary Clinton is scarred by media, mm-hmm. right? I can understand why certain other people might be feeling scarred by me. But the, you, but nothing, even she's not calling for us to be killed. <laughs> right, to be fair. Nothing has ha- yeah. been printed about you that was demonstrably false, mm-hmm. that was painful, that, that would allow you. I understand. Where, where's the where's the beginning story? Where's the origin story of why Trump hates media so much? Yeah. Right? Like I, I don't know what it is. I think it flows out of the typical Republican attack yeah. on media rather than anything in his actual... Because media has been his friend. We've been propping up talking about him for decades when there was no reason to talk about him. I agree. I agree. I I blame New York media for that and for our our situation. Oh, great. Now it's New York media. (laughs) I love New York, but they're they're, they're responsible. Uh, I want to close with this last quote from him. He said, uh, this one, talking about the the response, uh, this one has caught the imagination of the world, unfortunately. It's not a positive. Not a positive. Uh, that Thank is a, an absolutely pathetic quote. Yes, it is unfortunate, but not in the way that Donald Trump is implying. Uh, now, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, the anti meteor rhetoric a little bit later on the show. We do have to take our first break. When we come back, though, uh, Beto O'Rourke has a town hall with CNN, asked some pretty tough questions about his stance, especially on impeachment. We'll break that down after that. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un*** the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Let's turn now to the Senate race in Texas. Beto O'Rourke engaged in a hardcore fight against Ted Cruz. Recent polling puts Ted Cruz still up by five to nine points, depending on the poll that you look at. I don't know if that's changed since their big debate a couple of days ago, but last night CNN gave Beto O'Rourke a chance to potentially shake up the race in a town hall. Uh, We have a couple of different sections I want to talk about, but one thing that I think we should focus on was a line of attack that Ted Cruz used during their last debate when he pointed out that as an example of how Beto O'Rourke is an extreme left-wing radical, was that he was already pushing for impeachment of the president. Beto O'Rourke was asked about that in this video. There may be an open question as to whether the president, then the candidate, sought to collude with the Russian government in 2016. But to quote George Will, very conservative columnist, when we saw him on that stage in Helsinki defending Vladimir Putin, the head of the country that attacked our democracy in 2016, instead of this country and its citizens and this amazing democracy, that was collusion in action. Ultimately, however, Dana, this is a political question. A Republican colleague of mine in the House 
House will have to come before an audience like this and explain to her constituents or his constituents how they just voted to impeach the president of their own party, how they put their country ahead of their career or their next election or the politics of the moment. The best course to get there so that every member has all the facts and that they are compelling enough to do the right thing is to allow the full independence and integrity of the Bob Mueller investigation. But you've already said, according to the Constitution, that means that the president has committed the crime of treason, bribery, or a high crime and misdemeanor. Which one of those do you think the president has committed? I, I would liken uh, impeachment to an indictment. There, there is enough there to proceed with the trial for a full vetting of the facts. So that was interesting. It was a, a fairly strong response up until her follow-up question. And then he sort of backtracked a little bit. He didn't want to go on record as saying this is the particular offense that the president right. has committed. What do you think about his response there in the context of... Uh, there's been a huge disagreement amongst candidates in this midterm election about how to message around impeachment. Yeah, yeah. I wish I wish the left would stop talking about impeachment. I don't mm -hmm. think it's a winning issue. I don't think it's a smart uh, direction. I think it suggests to the American people we can find a way out of this national mm -hmm. ongoing emergency with through some sort of back door. And I understand a constitutional amendment is not a back door, but mm -hmm. we need to get ourselves out of this by voting, right? Mm -hmm. And Democrats should be saying, no, no, no. The only way out of this is for you guys to flood the polls in the midterms. And in 2020, there are more Democrats than Republicans in this country. If mm -hmm. we show up, we will win. We're voting at like 55%. That's our, that's our participation at this point. It does not look like millennials will be showing up in any greater numbers this time mm -hmm. than they typically do. You want to get rid of Trump? Show up and vote for us yeah. and we can help you. I feel like the impeachment conversation makes us seem like uh, sore losers. Mm -hmm. like, and not that we fairly lost 2016, but still, uh, it makes us seem like extremists. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it, it doesn't actually deal with the issue. If you said, we're never going to allow funding for the wall. We're never going to abandon Obamacare. You know, we're going to be there for you on this or that. We're going to fight Kavanaugh to the, to the mat. Like, mm -hmm. those are things that you can do that you should do. But the impeachment thing, I feel like, it's a bridge too far. It, 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 it locates us so far to the left mm. that it abandons the middle, the sliver in the middle, but still, and says to the right, people on the right, well, wait a minute now. Like, he was, we feel, if we watch Fox, he was fairly mm -hmm. elected. So you guys That's are going too far. So yeah. I, I, I would rather us stop talking about mm. that. And I think, to be fair, even Beto O'Rourke, who thinks that you know, there's enough there for impeachment. I, I don't think that he's going out talking about it all the time. Like he was asked about it yeah. uh, in the last debate. Ted Cruz brought it up. I think there are very few Democrats that are like enthusiastically talking about it, like Maxine Waters, maybe, and a yeah. couple of others. And that's pretty much it at this point. I think they're they're much more focused on things like health care and, and, you know, talking about the tax bill and stuff like that. Uh, just super fast. Uh, I guess just what is your your political calculus? Do you think if the Democrats take the House, will it happen? Will the Dems take the House? You, no, 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 I'm saying if they take Will the House. Will impeachment happen? You don't think that it'll happen? No, okay. I don't think it'll happen. I would rather see uh, you know, a greater policing of uh, the budget and these sort of things and expenditures, uh, you know, how we're appropriating. Um, I would rather see uh, investigations that mm -hmm. bring out the information, but rather than trying to go all the way to impeachment. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that if they take the House and they get those committee chair positions, I think that that yeah. is going to be one of the big outgrowths of that is uh, investigations I mean, that actually count for something. He'd actually have to start truly governing in a traditional way of mm -hmm. like, how do I truly deal with the other side? Because yeah. he deals with Democrats as a sort of straw man yeah. saying like, you guys suck, you guys are for <laughs> open borders and you guys are for crime and we have to defeat you guys. Rather than, okay, let's can we craft a proposal that they actually care about? Yeah. That'll uh, be an interesting change. That's that's what governing is, not mm -hmm. just sort of trying to beat the other side into submission. Yeah, and that that really changes it from sort of his preferred battleground to a, a very different sort of thing. Yes. We'll see how he responds to that. Yes. Okay, next. Uh, strategically, Beto O'Rourke in this last debate made a shift where uh, after in the first debate not wanting to talk about Ted Cruz's obvious huge rift with Donald Trump during the Republican primary of 2016, suddenly changed to calling him Lying Ted, a big change that Ted himself noted during the debate. Uh, he was asked about that at the town hall, and here's his response. 
I, I decided that I could either spend the rest of the debate responding to every single dishonest thing that he said, or I could uh, make sure that everyone understood exactly what he's doing. I said, look, he's dishonest. Uh, it's one of the reasons that he got tagged with this nickname, and that, that nickname resonates because it's true. Do you regret and, it? Um, you know, that, I, I, I don't... I don't I, I don't know that that's, that's the way that I want to be talking in, in this campaign. So he seems to regret it, at least a little bit, strategically, um, with him taking on a Republican senator in Texas who is up in the polls and has been basically the entire time. Yeah. Do you think that being willing to come out a little bit harsher on the attack with things like lying Ted is a good strategy? No. And is backing up from it a bad idea? No, I, I, I don't want to see Democrats sink to the level of engagement that Trump has brought us down to, that mm. a lot of Republicans are following him. Um, I don't want to see us become a mirror of them. Um, I follow the Michelle Obama uh, uh, doctrine rather than who was it said Eric Holder that, yeah who Eric Holder said we have to kick low like, when I, they go low we kick them yeah no I, I <laughs> you know much respect to the Attorney mm -hmm. General but I don't I don't agree with that I don't want to see uh, Beto and Andrew Gillum and Stacey Abrams you know coming up with nicknames and saying rude things about the other I, look Democrats deep down believe in the process and we believe in the value of government to solve problems yeah. Republicans main thesis is that government is the problem. Mm -hmm. So doing these sorts of things, cr making the debate in public so distasteful that people are like, oh, it's gross, yeah. you know, Washington is broken. That fits the Republican's entire thesis. This mm -hmm. does not fit the Democratic thesis to bring the discussion down to the gutter of nicknames and body part size and mm -hmm. like attacking each other the way that Trump would like to have it done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's going to be really interesting to see over the next few years if we ever come out of that. Or will, will we just expect that we are going to hear about every presidential nominee's penis at no, some point during I, the election? I, I think we will. I mean, when I look at the folks who are leading the Democratic charge right now, and I know we're very far out, mm -hmm. but it seems that it's probably Biden or Bernie or Kamala or Elizabeth Warren, probably somewhere in there, mm -hmm. maybe somebody else. These are people of class, of mm -hmm. taste, who are probably, hopefully, not going to... I mean, I know... I know, I know Kamala, right? I, I know who Bernie is. I know mm -hmm. who Joe Biden is. I don't think that they're going to go down that road. I didn't think Elizabeth Warren would play that game. I didn't appreciate her mm -hmm. doing what she did, like acknowledging the American Indian comment. Trump is, this is a racist slur, yeah. Pocahontas, that Trump runs around saying, right? I wish that Elizabeth Warren did not sort of meet him of like, I see what you're saying and I respond to it. But whatever. I expect <laughs> all these folks to elevate the discussion, yeah. and even when he's going low and being childish, to maintain a higher level of discussion, because that's what the presidency uh, merits. That's what mm -hmm. it, that's what we deserve, right? Somebody who is showing us character, is showing us comportment, is showing us how to be as a person, mm -hmm. and not this sort of gutter behavior that yeah. Trump loves and this childish behavior that m so much of what Trump does. If he did, if, we, if he was our child, he, we would reprimand mm -hmm. them, yeah. right? Even the, the Leslie Stahl conversation. I was thinking about his climate change answer. I'm like, oh my God. if my son said those things to his science teacher, sixth grade, mm -hmm. she would be like, "What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> F, no, that is not real." Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so you know, and we're at a new low when we dismiss scientists as politically biased, right? Yeah. So now we don't ever have to listen to any science we don't want to. Um, yeah, well, but no, as... I, want, I want Democrats to elevate the conversation even while Trump is embarrassing himself. Okay, well, you know, we're going to take a break. When we come back, he is going to, uh, from my point of view, embarrass himself again, actually, on the topic That's of violence daily. against the media. It is. We've got more for you after this. Welcome back to the show, everyone. John Edderall, Trey in studio. Hey, thank, thank you. It's been great talking to you. Yeah, nice I'm talking fun. to you, too. This is the only thing I want in my life right now is just someone who's just fun to talk to. Well, you know, what I appreciate about you Graduate school in political science, you really know what you're talking about. There's I try. not that many people uh, who have a real engagement with the real information mm -hmm. who actually <laughs> worked in Washington, like Lawrence O'Donnell did, like Chris Hayes did, um, uh, Chris Matthews, or like had a real engagement in this, like work, mm -hmm. like Simone Sanders, like worked for Bernie Sanders. They really, mm -hmm. you know, talking to Angela Rye, like she actually worked in Congress, like that actually 
helps understand yeah. everything. And you really understand. I'm trying. Because of the background, not like someone like me who just sort of like <laughs> read a lot. I interned for Dukakis, but I was very, uh-huh. very young. Like, you know, I've just, I've read a lot. I have some opinions. But You interned like, for Dukakis? Like, yes. Older than I, I think. I think you're you old. Think? Your age is different than I thought it was, it actually. Is different. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like, you know, Crystal Ball's understanding, you mm-hmm. know, because she ran for Congress, she understands the process. It's different than mine, right? Mm-hmm. It's different than a lot of people's, and I appreciate that. Okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Let's turn now to something I don't appreciate. Uh, (laughs) Donald Trump was at another of his rallies. That's basically all he does right now. Occasionally, a little bit of golf, generally political rallies. So he was in Montana, and he was, uh, I mean, what you're supposed to say is he was there to support Greg Gianforte. Basically, he was there to rant and occasionally mention something about Greg Gianforte. But if you don't remember Gianforte, uh, he's the guy that during the run-up to a special election, uh, body slammed a reporter who dared to ask him about his support for the Republican health care bill. Uh, he is now going to be running against Democrat Kathleen Williams. And uh, the most interesting thing uh, to me is that he violently attacked a reporter, then pled guilty for it. Uh, turns out I share that with Donald Trump, as you'll see this in the, this video. <laughs> I never wrestle him. You understand that? Never. Any guy that can do a body slam, he's my kind. He's my guy. And we endorsed Greg very early, but I had heard that he body slammed a reporter. And he was way up. And he was way up, and I said, oh, this was like the day of the election or just before. And I said, oh, this is terrible. He's going to lose the election. Then I said, well, wait a minute. I know Montana pretty well. I think it might help him. And it did. So two things super fast. Uh, One, is it hard to body slam someone? I don't think it's that hard to body slam someone. Like, I think most people could probably manage it if they need to. (laughs) And second of all, we're going to be joking around a little bit, I think, because of how ridiculous it is. But... I, so much has been normalized over the past few years. He said he body slammed a reporter, and thousands of people around him cheered. That is a sickening display. Yeah, it's disgusting. It's gross. And this is the sort of evil that Trump brings out of folks. Mm-hmm. Um, there's nothing to cheer that mm-hmm. one person physically attacks another. I mean, for asking a question. For asking a question. I mean, I, you know. Look, I do support violence in some very <laughs> limited situations. I think if you see Richard Spencer, you should punch <laughs> Richard Spencer. Okay. That should happen. He is mm-hmm. a professional racist. But outside of fringe characters like that, mm-hmm. like, no, this person should not have body slammed the mm-hmm. other person who was doing his job and not posing a physical threat to yeah. them. Um, and that Trump uses this, but this is typical of him, of like, you know, we will be physically violent toward our enemies, right? Like, yeah. you know, in the old days, he would have been out of here in a stretcher. Ha, ha, ha. Mm-hmm. So do it to you now. Like, I'll pay, I'll pay for your legal fees if you knock him out. I mean, like, he's constantly encouraging violence. You know, so typically, you win the presidency, and then you reach out to the other side, mm-hmm. right? Because... It's a big country, and you are president of everybody. And also, if you want to be reelected, you need to pull some people from the other side. That entire math has completely missed him, right? And he's only like, just attack the other side, give them no quarter, don't give them any policy they might like, physically attack them, you know, call them out. It's the right accused Obama of creating division in the Mm. country when he did not. He did not. He was a figure who was divisive, but he tried very hard to be a uniter, even to people who did not like him. That just was his character back to Harvard Law and before. Mm -hmm. Um, Trump's whole modus operandi is to create division so that the people on his side will be even more intense and with him. Um, It's disgusting. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's disgusting. And, and, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I don't want to laugh about it because it's so disgusting. And I don't want to normalize it like, yeah. oh, Trump does crazy stuff like this every day. Mm. Like, no, this is, this is like horrifying. Like, no, the president should not be speaking like this about celebrating the the a physical attack on a journalist. Yeah. Like, no, that's crazy talk. Yeah, and it's like, like, so it's crazy by itself. It's also crazy in a couple of different contexts that it exists in. So first of all, we are still a country where not that long ago, a guy walked in a newsroom and started gunning down journalists. Yeah. That happened yeah. a few months ago, and Donald Trump cared about it 
maybe for 10 or 15 minutes. They and then cared he went more back about to, Sarah Sanders getting kicked out of a restaurant. Yeah, or you know, Michelle Wolf talking about her smoky eye shadow got more. Uh, okay, so we had that. You had um, there was another uh, reporter who a guy walked onto her live shot and gunned her down. Um, this is a thing that happens in our country. I don't want that to be normalized. It also exists in the context of we are worried that Donald Trump is going to do nothing about Saudi Arabia having brutally tortured and murdered a journalist. Yeah. And while he's under the spotlight for that, he goes and says, isn't it funny when you brutalize journalists? Yeah. Isn't that a great thing that should make you do better in the polls? So that's our country. <laughs> it's just as, and by the way, the final bit of context, it would be one thing if the Republicans decided we are going to be the party of the proud boys and we're going to be the party of the Gianforte body slamming journalists and we're going to have the guns and we're going to be the violent macho ones and all of that. But they're not satisfied with that. They want that. And at the same time, the new narrative in the midterm elections is the left wing is a mob. Is a mob. The left wing are the violent ones. The Isn't mob? it funny when you body slam someone? They're a mob right we're, over there. We're the mob that's too extreme to govern. But we, <laughs> but we encourage violence against mm -hmm. Americans who don't agree with us. Yeah. That's an amazing thing. Like I said on the main show a week ago, like we, we like to, some people say that the right wing are, they're not as inquisitive, they're not that critical thinkers, but they do have a certain mental flexibility that they can maintain those two things simultaneously <laughs> in their brain and be perfectly happy Look, with it. Look, there's nothing that I believe as a liberal mm -hmm. where there's a community of experts saying that's just not true. Mm -hmm. There are so many things that are fundamental to the modern Republican agenda yeah. on climate, on immigration, on crime, on drugs, that experts are like, no, that is not true. And they're like, well, yeah. screw experts. <laughs> who cares about elites? Who cares about information? Who cares about intellectuals? Who cares about media? Mm. I mean, if you reject science, media, and intellectuals, who are you listening to? Donald Trump, <laughs> I think, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's a book, The Death of Expertise. Uh, we should get the, uh, the author on, I think. Okay, we're going to take another break. When we come back- uh, well, The Thomas Frank book. Is it the, the last Thomas Frank book dealt a lot with that too. That's, um, what was the name of that one? I don't remember. I don't remember. We're going to look it up at the break. We'll come back with that title. Also, an absolutely abhorrent ad that is running in Arkansas after this. Welcome back, everyone, to The Damage Report. Obviously, the midterms are going on, and over the past week or two, we've been profiling a lot of really horrendous ads, uh, generally from Republicans, although yesterday we uh, showed you a few of Joe Donnelly's ads. And uh, today, we've got an ad coming out of Arkansas. This is a radio ad. It is by a super PAC. It's not by the candidate himself, but it's in support of Republican French Hill. And just take a look at this. It is, in its own terrible way, absolutely fabulous. What do you think about what's happening in Washington? Congressman French Hill and the Republicans know that it's dangerous to change the presumption of innocence to a presumption of guilt, especially for black men. If the Democrats can do that to a white justice of the Supreme Court with no evidence, no corroboration, and all of her witnesses, including her best friend, say it didn't happen, what will happen to our husbands, our fathers, or our sons when a white girl lies on them? Girl, white Democrats will be lynching black folk again. Honey, I've always told my son, don't be messing around with that. If you get caught, she will cry rape. I'm voting to keep Congressman French Hill and the Republicans because we have to protect our men and boys. We can't afford to let white Democrats take us back to bad old days of race verdicts, life sentences, and lynchings when a white girl screams rape. Paid for by black Americans for the president's agenda. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. Wow. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Wait, I need a bucket because I have to throw up. Because that was seriously disgusting. Was that... Was that Silk and diamond or whatever. The, was that them? I think it, I don't I, know that it is. I think that's what they were going for. I, I mean, this is a really arch sort of coonish black. But we got to protect our men and our husbands mm -hmm. from these white women. When they said, don't mess around with that. At first, I thought they're going to say, don't mess around with the Democrats. But mm -hmm. I think what that was, a, don't mess around with white I women. I think that's what they meant. Which yeah. was like, what, what? Yeah. That, I mean... Victimhood circus there, right? And the right is, and Trump are all about, we are the real victims. This new line about it is men who are really the ones mm -hmm. who are in trouble with this Me Too thing, and we need to protect our sons and our husbands from this 
marauding caravan of women who are going around lying mm -hmm. about our men. This is that was so disgusting. <laughs> it was it's frightening. Yeah, yeah, and uh, that's what's around there now. Look, as we said. This is not an ad by the Republican, uh, to be clear. And in fact, French Hill, the Republican that's mentioned there, says some may have heard an appalling ad on the radio. I condemn this outrageous ad in the strongest terms. I do not support that message, and there is no place in Arkansas uh, for this nonsense. It now, would not air if he didn't want it to air. Yeah, I, I and don't, that's, that's what the Democrats said in response. Yeah, I, I don't believe that he can just say, like, that's just something that somebody who supports me said. I don't have mm -hmm. anything to do with that. If he really didn't want that, it would not have made it's the light of day. Weeks. Yeah. It's been on for weeks. Yeah. It was like a $50,000 well, ad buy. I mean, like, even if you said, Tori, you don't know what you're talking about. These, this has to be separate. Mm -hmm. But after the first time, surely somebody in the campaign would say, you got to kill that. Yeah, like, yeah. We don't need this. Like, what are you talking about? That's not who we want to be. Like, mm -hmm. no. And they just let it go. I mean, this is this is up there with Willie Horton and these sort of race baiting ads that are, I mean, I don't even know who are these black folk for Trump. Well, people? let's talk about like, that. <laughs> I did a little bit of research. So, oh, okay, uh, good. Yeah, bear in mind, this is a district that's twenty three percent black. So, uh, you know, that's a, that's an important, that's a disproportionately large percentage mm -hmm. of that mm -hmm. district. So uh, Vernon Robinson uh, is the founder of Black Americans for the President's Agenda. He is black. He says that this ad is revenge for the Kavanaugh hearings, which sort of comes through in the ad. Why do you need revenge? He's, you won. He says that it was just, that's a great point. But <laughs> he says uh, the Me Too movement has overreached. If Claire McCastle gets less than 90% of the black vote, she loses. Um, ads like this have run in one other location as well in a different state. So uh, Black Americans for the president, President's Agenda is founded by a conservative black American. I did some research, and this is the... This is the worst kind of research. Don't put any faith in this whatsoever. But I went on Open Secrets and I looked at who's funding this group. And they've raised somewhere between sixty and $120,000, almost all in $1,000 increments. So this is not like a populist sort of thing. Right. And I am just going based on an analysis of the names. I don't think that black Americans are funding this group. <laughs> That's a crazy thing to say, I know. But um, I mean, yeah. this, this, this sudden fear from the locker up crowd that you know we're we're tending toward guilty until proven innocent mm -hmm. and thus we're worried about getting lynched i mean the the way you know i'm i'm old enough to remember the autopsy after mm -hmm. what was it 2012 mm -hmm. right when Reince Priebus said oh, yeah, hey yeah. we got to reach out to people of color we cannot be an apartheid party that's filled with white people mm -hmm. but they struggle how do we reach out to people of color? Partly because within the right, there's a desire to not discuss race, right? Mm -hmm. As if color blindness is the ultimate state. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you guys do identity politics. Well, you do too. You just do it for white people, mm -hmm. right? But. It, and I would say more consistently and more obviously. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's hard to do actual outreach to black and brown people if you're like, but we must be colorblind because talking about race is racism in and of itself. Yeah. Um, this is this is really, like the more it settles in, the more disgusting it is, just the, the coonish tone of the voices, the suggestion that lynching is coming next, that mm -hmm. men are the real victims here. And we, I mean, so much of this, mimics the president's language during and after Kavanaugh. Yeah. So you see a very direct relationship between the president saying these insane fact-based, fact-free things and uh, the right grabbing it and repeating it. This lie about her best friend said it didn't happen. That did mm -hmm. not, that is She not, says she believes her. Right, that is right. That is not what happened. Dr. Ford explained exactly what happened. Her lawyer made a statement. Her friends, you know, I mean, this notion of like there's no evidence and no corroboration, it's just disgusting. Yeah, yeah, they've been, um, I mean, look, there's there's propaganda on all sides, but lately it really does seem like it spreads through the 25 to 30% that absolutely loves Donald Trump will, will believe anything he says so quickly. Like as as I've been looking at um, like tweets about Jamal Khashoggi, the, his death, 
they have they have convinced a significant portion of the country that he was a terrorist almost instantly. Sure. And you, any post online it will get Twitter responses, he's a terrorist, he's al-Qaeda, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It went so quickly. And so in this sort of thing too, the guilty until proven innocent, like the thing that, you know what was really lynching people? It was libs. Libs were going around lynching lots of people. You need to worry about that. Yes, it was generally Democrats, <laughs> but this is like. I love that part. This is Dinesh D'Souza level historical analysis. It was Democrats who wanted segregation. So mm-hmm. you're on the wrong side. Like, yeah. But the party switched. Mm-hmm. So like the people who were voting for that are now on your Tory, side. It's not even worth bringing it up because they will never accept that realignment actually happened. <laughs> one other thing, by the way, again, you, I think you should be able to have one thing. You can have the fake ads pretending that black Americans need to worry about Democrats lynching them if Democrats win. Um, or you can go around the country disenfranchising minority communities absolutely horribly all over the place. It's going on right now in a number of places, but they're doing both at the same time. So that is truly disgusting. Mm. Uh, we're gonna take a short break. When we come back, uh, Torrey is actually gonna be basically going almost directly from here to Politicon. I wanna break down a few of the different conversations he's gonna be having on the other side of this break. Okay, we only have a few minutes left remaining in the show. So, uh, in advance of this weekend, which is Politicon weekend, you know, Saturday, Saturday, Saturday. Uh, so, uh, Trey, and Sunday. And Sunday, 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 the 20th and 21st, I think it is. Uh, you are going to be involved in multiple panels. Uh, I was looking up some of them. It is interesting stuff. Uh, you're actually doing a panel, a one on one conversation with Dennis Rodman. I am doing a conversation with the worm. We're going to talk about the Bulls. We're going to talk about a lot of things. We're definitely going to talk about North Korea and his visits with Kim Jong Un and what he got out of that, what he wanted to get out of that, and just the real nature of diplomacy and his support for Trump. These sort of things. Like, is he an overall supporter of Trump? I am. To- I haven't fully figured it out. I mean, like, you know, a lot of people. He's like. I, he's like more like Trump adjacent. Is he really like out there like we need a wall? I'm not sure about that. Mm-hmm. But I think he like appreciates Trump rather than like ah oh, reject this guy. I mean, there's no okay. middle ground, right? It, you're either like yeah. repulsed or you're like yay, it's all about Trump. I think there are some relu- reluctant Republican voters. I guess. I guess it seems like I don't know. Just just in general, we have lost the middle. Mm-hmm. Right in American politics, there's That's no true. there's no winnable side. Right, the game is to go to the edges rather than move to the middle. Mm-hmm. Right, and win over the the sort of swing. There's no swing vote. Right, mm-hmm. it's just sort of like go to the edges and try to get the fringes to come out. Well, I guess if there is a swing vote, it might be the Democrats that switch over from voting for Obama to voting for Trump to some extent. Is that a swing? I don't know if that's a swing. I, it, I, I mean, I we'll think, have to see if it swings I think back. Historically, you would call that a swing vote, but I don't. I don't. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't feel them swinging because I didn't. I didn't. I think in, in 2016, they were up for grabs. They were really? like, we don't like her, we like it, mm-hmm. right? I mean, like a swing vote to me is like, you're deciding, you're still thinking it out. So it's more of a out. contingent vote than a swing vote, maybe. I, th- I wonder if there is a sliver in the middle that mm-hmm. will vote but is less political and sees some value in Trump, sees some problems with Trump, but will mm-hmm. say, you know... Every time I go to the movies, I come out and I look at my phone to see if the world has blown up. Mm-hmm. Every morning I pick up my phone to see if World War III started while I was sleeping. I want this constant chaos to end. Mm-hmm. If he was a Dem or Republican, I don't care. I need the chaos to end. Mm-hmm. And she's going to end the chaos. Mm-hmm. And I can go back to when politics was boring. I liked that. Because yeah. I don't need this agita. I watch the news. I freak out. I don't need that anymore. <laughs> I think that there's a like oh, half of a percent sliver like that that will say, whoever the Dems got, I'm going for them. Because this but this is but this is making yeah. my blood pressure, boy. I can't have this. You, you there are all these women who say they haven't had orgasm since Trump was elected. <laughs> what? This is a thing. I think that's the guy's fault more than Trump's. <laughs> Maybe, but it's I think inhibiting they share them. Blame. It's inhibiting. That is how. That is how terrible Trump is. That not only do the women having sex with him not have orgasms, but it has an aura. <laughs> but other around. women not having sex with him are yeah. also not having it's orgasms. It's like a superpower, it, it, um, like a negative superpower. Kind of, yeah. Uh, but speaking about the whole worrying about the world, blow up. Uh, last uh, autumn, I spent a couple of weeks on a ship 
cut off from contact. I was doing a documentary at the time. Sounds nice. And yeah, that was right around like the, the real fears about nuclear war and things like that. I was worried like we're going to dock and it's just going to be a smoldering wasteland. <laughs> Didn't um, this used to be no LA? Way. Yeah. <laughs> it's all flat. So I, I also wanted to ask you, we only have another minute or so. Uh, you have a podcast on our network, I The do. Torre Show. I do. You have uh, an awesome number of different unique guests from different walks of life and everything. Um, so what is uh, going into an episode of your show? What's, what's the mission of your show? The mission is to say... You're a successful person. Let's talk about how you became successful Mm -hmm. and what are the things you know and that you do that help you be successful. Mm -hmm. Like one thing I see consistently is these people are very positive in their self-talk, especially Mm -hmm. in the morning. Right? Hmm. Tiffany Haddish talks about getting up in the morning and looking in the mirror right into the center of her eyes and saying, you are enough. I love you. You're good enough and you're doing a good job. And liver, you're doing a good job. And heart, you're doing a good job. And just filling herself with positive messages. And I see this because Will Packer, Hollywood producer, said the same thing yesterday. I was with Santi Gold, the musician. She said similar things about positive internal self-messages. And awesome. that is an amazing fuel. Okay. And that's what you can get from watching uh, or from listening to a show. Yeah. Available on our network. You can also go see him all this weekend at Politicon. If you're in the LA area, you definitely should. Sounds like awesome conversations. Uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Great to get a chance to meet you. Nice I'm following your work, you. but thank in person. You. Uh, thank you for watching both today and all this week. We'll be back next week with so much more for you. We'll see you then. Thank you for listening to the Damage Report podcast, the show covering the true threats facing our country and what you can actually do about them. You can support this free podcast by leaving us a review and giving us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you happen to be listening to it. Every review helps more people discover the show at no cost to you. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.